Well, welcome back to the afternoon sessions here at the Tatra Summit. If you missed uh, uh, Eleanor's session with the central bank governors, let me just give you a few takeaways to set the stage for this next conversation. Um, they've said that policy response needs to be tailored to each crisis. You can't let you know, take away from previous crises. Uh, that's a pretty obvious given there from them. Disagreement about what actually is a united approach holds up even today, and that policy is a blunt tool. You can't use it for everything. You cannot paint broad brushes with it. This afternoon, we're kicking off uh, this section of the program talking about the strategic transformation of the CEE. The uh, session will be led by Sonia Mozikarova, Chief Economist at Globesec's uh, Policy Institute. But before I get there, I want to take the opportunity to highlight the 2021 Globesec Transformation Index that she and her team have created. It is a fantastic quantitative tool and really addresses some of the issues you've heard through the afternoon. The index measures strategic transformation in the CEE last year. It ranks nine countries on macro fundamentals, resilience, education, digital and green transitions, and the capacity to innovate, most importantly. Now, some of the results that Sonia and her team have come up with uh, show that the top performers are Austria, Slovenia, and the Czech Republic, followed by Poland and Hungary, with the Slovak Republic coming in at number six. But the crux of the report is that most countries have been resilient, but their shortcomings in the macro model have really grown. But this is the cool thing about the index. It provides policymakers with a diagnostic map of weak and strong areas of policy. So if anybody needed guidance, it's pretty much sitting in here. So pick up one of these. It is going to feed into a number of conversations that you will have over the next coming months and years, to say the least, especially because I understand, Sonia, this is going to be done every single year. Uh, based on this year's results, I want to leave you with this. Slovenia, Poland, and Austria exhibit the strongest education outcomes. Austria, Croatia, and Slovenia are closest to gre the greening frontier. The Czech Republic, Austria, and Slovenia remain the top digital performers, and Austria and Slovenia demonstrate the most advanced innovation economy. So you know where the CEE countries stand at this point. Here's the flip side. Bulgaria was found to need work on its external resilience and productivity. Oh, that's across the board overall. Croatia needs to work on improving its financial fundamentals. And the weakest structural areas for Slovakia are education and the capacity to innovate. It's a pretty easy tool to use. It provides a breadth of information. Um, like I mentioned before this, uh, this afternoon, you'll find them laid across the hotel. So do pick up one of these books. I'm now going to hand you into the very, very safe hands of the woman who let, let this be possible for us to figure out this information. Sonia, I'm going to give it to you to take this conversation forward from that report. Thank you very much. All right, I think we're ready. All right, so uh, again, thank you very much, Maitre, for this uh, generous summary of the main findings uh, of the report. And uh, first and foremost, good afternoon, uh, excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. We have about 40 minutes to discuss the strategic recovery of the sea region and how this plays out with a so-called K-shaped recovery, which we will debunk with uh, our great panel today, just to offer some contextual background for this discussion. The previous panel with the three governors recounted what monetary policy has done for us and how it needs to better coordinate with fiscal policy to forge a robust recovery. Now, I would like to take a step back and uh, talk about fiscal policy because in many respects, fiscal policy is the new kid on the block. It really has been fully deployed since the pandemic has landed and before the pandemic, it was monetary policy doing uh, a lot of the heavy lifting. And I'd like to explore three main facets here with respect to uh, fiscal policy. The first one is effectiveness. Uh, these fiscal stimuli rolled out really have been massive by historical standards. Um, and I want to explore with our panel really how effective they have been in putting the floor beneath the crisis. The second aspect is on perhaps uh, thinking about or, or starting uh, rolling some of this support back uh, in, the, in the current climate of a 
robust rebound um, and the robust activity that we see in trade and manufacturing. Um, and the third aspect is the K-shaped recovery dynamics. So the fact that this um, pandemic has created winners and losers across sectors, across regions, across uh, countries. And how does that fit into the uh, future course of policy? So before we get down to business, I'd like to finally um, uh, introduce our panel. We have His Excellency Mr. Uh, Master, uh, Marcel Klimek, the State Secretary from the Ministry of Finance of the Slovak Republic. Good afternoon. Um, we have next to me, I have Mr. Gordon Bainai, who is the former Prime Minister uh, of Hungary, and currently he heads uh, infrastructure projects at Campbell Lutens, a private equity firm based off of London. Welcome. Gordon. Thank you, Sonia. And last but not least, we have Mr. Michal Czarny, who is the general manager for Czechia and Slovakia um, for MasterCard based off of Prague. Welcome, Michal. Good afternoon. So without for, uh, further ado, um, we have these massive stimuli rolled out, right? They were pretty robust and indiscriminate by even historical standards. And based on the incoming information uh, that we have, the declaration of bankruptcy, bankruptcies um, have been down throughout a good portion of 20 and 2021. Um, we have not seen extraordinary spikes in non-performing loans all across the board. And we have even seen some new business creation, which is pretty spectacular for a crisis like this. So I'd like to start with you, uh, State Secretary Klimek. Can you maybe bring us up to speed as to what instruments have been rolled out in Slovakia and perhaps the region, and which ones do you um, deem most effective in putting the floor beneath this crisis? Thank you very much. Uh, I may, maybe I will start with the uh, K-shaped uh, recovery as, uh, as the title of this uh, panel is and uh, in the first round as the globsec today started there was a question who's here for the first time and my hand was up because uh, i'm here for the first time and when, when i'm doing something for first time i try to prepare properly and and i make my remarks three four days ago and uh, I thought aloud is good. We have K-shaped recovery. It means some industries are recovering, biotech, e-commerce, uh, I don't know, uh, all them. And the other ones uh, are performing poorer. It's culture, uh, tourism, and so on and so on. How does it fit with today when Mark Zuckerberg lost six billions? It's a Facebook. And then a small story uh, come to me, uh, and I want to share this anecdote with you, and maybe uh, you know them, that uh, uh, Google, Wikipedia, uh, Internet, and uh, Facebook met, and uh, each of them made statements, so buddies. Facebook told, I know everybody. Yeah, nice. Uh, Google, I can find everything. Nice. Wikipedia, I know everything. And the internet, I have it all. And in the corner, in the dark corner, there was a fifth buddy, and he's telling, yeah, keep talking, buddies, keep talking. Who was that? Energy. And you know the energy is the key <laughs> where the next crisis started uh, two, three weeks ago, and the price is spiking. Therefore, for me, it was a remark where we all been taught or learned a lesson from the pandemic crisis that we still have to be humiliated or the humility before all the actions are taken uh, and uh, all the points our activities uh, shall be covered by were for me humanity humility and hard work it was a great idea of prime minister in the first panel that between the opportunity and the success, there is a hard work. And this is what we have to do. And coming back to, uh, to your uh, question, yeah, we, this, the government uh, of Slovak Republic in 2020 in March come with full of enthusiasm to the role and immediately was caught uh, by, by the pandemic uh, issue and almost nothing was prepared here. I mean, uh, in Germany, there was a 120 pages of uh, pandemic plan. Here, it was zero page uh, prepared. So uh, we started from a zero-based uh, level, and uh, in two weeks, there was a request from, uh, from uh, many sites. 
please implement short-term work scheme. I mean, the Kurzarbeit, it was already uh, mentioned. I'm asking, where, where are the basics? Yeah, we presented it four years ago to the government, but nothing is implemented. Yeah, and you want us now in two weeks to have it implemented, and we did it. And, and you know that we implement uh, short-term work scheme in two weeks uh, from the beginning, and now we have already implemented short-term work as a long-term scheme, starting with uh, January 1st uh, next year. And, so coming to your question, uh, out of the three billions which this year Slovak Republic uh, budget is spending on, on COVID expenditures, recovery expenditures, and uh, mitigation of uh, all the losses, uh, half of this, 1.45 uh, billion, is the short-term uh, working uh, scheme, and it helps a lot. It's definitely uh, worked perfectly, so uh, the, uh, the losses on the employment side were mitigated to very low level, up to 0.3%, uh, uh, and are already uh, recovering. So this was one of the, uh, one of the most important uh, measures. The second one was even huger, uh, coming up to 1.6 uh, billions, and this is uh, the banking schemes. We have implemented two schemes. One scheme is the guaranteed loans. So we started with new loans with, with a state guarantee up to 80 or 90 percent. And the other one scheme was the liquidity injection in form of postponements of installments. And both worked perfectly. So this was liquidity booster, huge liquidity booster uh, to the overall economy. And uh, it works very effectively and efficiently. Uh, generally, effectiveness uh, has to be seen uh, with, with the eyes of uh, 2020, uh, 2020, and at that time, uh, the, the more, more important than to be effective down to the last euro, it was to deliver. And we were able uh, to deliver uh, the major schemes, and they worked properly. Out of these uh, schemes, there was a plenty of other uh, schemes. We have had uh, rent cost scheme uh, up to 95 million euro and 40 million euro a second year. Then we have the tourism scheme, which was uh, totaling in two years 228 uh, million, and uh, some other cultural scheme, uh, 30 million euro, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, and at the end, the figures sh are showing that the help or the support uh, was very effective because we have had, on a cumulative basis, a decrease in profits, not in profits, uh, in corporate taxes, just by, by 0.1% compared in 2020 to 2090, which is for me unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. It's not distributed uh, equally. Yes, we have three sectors uh, where uh, the damage is the highest, and this is cultural area, this is tourism, and this is gastro, it means restaurants and so on, where the losses were up to 40 and above 40% uh, compared to uh, 2090. But on the microeconomical picture, we performed surprisingly uh, well with corporate profit uh, tax uh, lower by just 0.1%. This is, for me, the main message. So the unemployment developed above expectation and corporate profits in the total number performed above expectation, which in total help us uh, to uh, move in the accommodation uh, in the overall European, European Union, where we have three or four years uh, where we are not able to catch up with the with the average uh, GDP uh, growth, but now we are above. So, so these are the figures which uh, present that uh, so far we were able to give the appropriate response. And uh, the, the speed or, uh, yeah, to be quick in this response were, was even more uh, important than to be efficient down to the last euro. Okay, uh, thank you very much and congratulations. So not only were these measures effective, but you even uh, managed to keep the tax revenue losses in check and contained. That's so exactly. that's wonderful. 
Okay, uh, turning to you, Gordon, you have this interesting um, uh, mix of experience as a very high-level statesman, but also currently uh, heading the infrastructure projects at a leading private equity firm. So what is your take? Uh, do you observe signs of a strong recovery in your line of business? And do we, to a large extent, owe this to the fiscal stimuli that have been rolled out all across the board? Let me start from the macro side. So I agree with the State Secretary that, uh, and it's in a broader sense in Europe and in the world, governments reacted well or at least much, much better than to the great financial crisis 10 years ago, 11 years ago, in terms of uh, fiscal policy reaction. Also learning from, from the mistakes of, of 10 years ago, Kurzarbeit is one example of that. They reacted very well. Uh, also, they were supported by two facts. This was not an economic crisis in, in its origins. This was a completely in, independent thing. It was not a crisis of indebtedness or slow growth or other problems. It was, a, it was an independent crisis which heavily impacted the, uh, the economy. The reaction, the first reaction was mostly appropriate. Depends also how indebted the country is, how much can they afford, but overall everybody took on a lot of that. Now, I think everybody who is a leader in a national bank or, or somewhere has to now think ahead or in a ministry of what, what's the impact of this incredible amount of debt that was taken on by governments. And, and that's a big risk uh, in my mind because this debt was taken on in a very low interest rate environment, a very low inflation environment. The question is what happens if that changes? Uh, inflation is up now, but that was expected year on year. That's normal after a, a fallback. The question is, is inflation going to stay? And if, is inflation going to stay? And some governments have gone to extremely high debt levels. Uh, then many of the central banks in the world, it was a very interesting discussion in the previous uh, session, many of the central banks in the world are to a degree trapped in the sense they should increase interest rates to, to stem inflation, uh, but uh, they may bankrupt their own governments, who are sometimes 130, 150, 60 percent debt to GDP. That's a huge dilemma, and that's, that's why inflation is the number one question when I look at my current territory, mm -hmm. for example, infrastructure finance or more broadly finance. Uh, what happens with interest rates, and how will it impact uh, uh, economic uh, uh, growth. So that's one uh, uh, thing. The, the other one is, uh, why don't I stop here? You, you, you have to ask many questions. Okay. Okay, we can stop here and we will definitely uh, get back to the current macroeconomic developments, deflationary yeah. pressures and uh, many of the things you have mentioned. But before we do, I want to uh, give the floor to Mr. Charney and I want to ask you, how did my MasterCard respond to the pandemic and what were some of the challenge, challenges that you had to deal with against the backdrop of this policy discussion also um, that we're having? So, I mean, as the payment scheme, the one thing that we have seen was that the digital payments infrastructure as such became probably the most important uh, element uh, or its importance has increased in, in, in time uh, significantly for smooth operations of the economics uh, in the economy in the country. So what we, have, what we have been working on as our number one priority is, of course, make sure the infrastructure is resilient, meaning that the digital payments are still the, not only the most convenient, but also the safest, and, uh, and the most secure uh, means, means of payment. Uh, but we were working a lot on accessibility of that infrastructure because that was a topic that was very much highlighted. And by accessibility, I mean accessibility to consumers. So in a lot of European countries, we were uh, working on raising uh, the limits for contactless payments so that those can be done uh, very seamlessly without interactions with the payment terminal. Uh, we were working on access to the digital payments infrastructure by the small and medium enterprises, uh, by entrepreneurs, because suddenly 
uh, acceptance of digital payments became a hygienic factor. It was a, a, a shop or no shop decision, which, uh, which many consumers were doing during the pandemic. So we wanted to make sure that digital payments do not stay only the domain of the large retail, but it can be really an infrastructure accessible to all. So in, in many countries, we have started projects focusing on this. But what was, what was probably very interesting is that uh, uh, the pandemic uh, showed us that uh, there is a lot of potential in uh, the domain of public-private partnerships and that we can actually go beyond the payments business as such and we can start looking at very interesting areas of cooperation with the governments, uh, such as working with data to make sure that there is timely information about how uh, the different uh, recovery measures uh, take effect in the economy and how do we, that we measure them right. We were working with insights to support planning for recovery of highly impacted tourism sector, as was, as was mentioned. Um, you are working on topics of cyber security where we are basically taking the global know-how from, uh, you know, something that is very much on the, on the forefront of attention when it comes to cyber threats the payments uh, financial world. We're trying to bring the know-how outside into industries such as healthcare, such as, uh, such as others. And finally, uh, also uh, the pandemic brought, uh, brought uh, more attention to topics such as sustainability. So we were looking at how we can support sustainability, not only in terms of, uh, you know, looking at our own business, which uh, quite frankly has relatively limited environmental impact, but mostly how we can use the network to engage consumers, engage citizens to make more informed decisions in terms of sustainability and contribute so that we can change the landscape from regulation to a positive uh, momentum. Thank you very much uh, for, your, for your account and we will get back uh, to that in a little bit, but I would like to pick your brains on something else right now. So. Uh, yes, we are having the energy crisis, but uh, based on many data and incoming information all across the board, we're also having a robust recovery in terms of the volumes of manufacturing, the volumes of, of trade, even the, the, supply, uh, the sector specific supply shortages uh, are in some respect a testament to that. Um, and of course, we have the rising inflation that has been mentioned uh, time and time again throughout the summit. So this is one thing, the macroeconomic conditions. And then we also have to remember that as the pandemic landed in the region, the, the region was already at a declining path in terms of productivity and in terms of competitiveness. So then there is the consideration of productivity. Um, keeping indiscriminate fiscal support for a long time uh, and, and supporting sometimes unproductive firms and sometimes unviable business models. So considering the macro conditions and this productivity argument, um, what is your take, and I would like to hear very briefly from each of you, what is your take on getting more selective with this help and perhaps rolling a little bit some of this help back, uh, maybe starting with State Secretary Klimek. Yeah. For me, uh, first, we have to understand uh, what's behind the uh, current development. Uh, the inflation and uh, this acceleration in GDP has two parents and one trigger. Uh, the parents are globalization and optimization, and the trigger was the pandemic. Uh, so. Uh, uh, we now have uh, the problems in certain automotive or chip industry and so on. And uh, the reasoning behind is that we in the past streamlined uh, all the processes and we have only few producers of several uh, goods. And even these deliveries are optimized in schemes just in time and uh, uh, without any, any uh, reserves or any bottoms that uh, we could adopt. And this needs time. And if you do not have, yeah, to adopt to the, to the reduction, it's easy. Yeah. You close your lines and uh, uh, are uh, closed. But to adopt to immediately tripling or quadrupling uh, the demand, it's impossible in situation of optimization and globalization. And therefore, 
this reaction will take some time, but yesterday I had a meeting uh, with, with the ASA uh, head, this is the European Association of uh, uh, Energy Regulators, and uh, we went into the detail and the answer was, or the main expectation is, that yeah, we will have spike uh, in ele electricity prices and energy as well, but the futures, market futures, options and so on, uh, are showing that this should then in second quarter of the next year uh, went lower and uh, then we could come to a new normal. New normal won't be the, uh, the old normal because yes, we have in place the, all the green policies uh, uh, now turning into fit for uh, 55, which means uh, the cost of CO2 will be there and the policies, they shall be there uh, and increase the, uh, the fossil production costs and so on, but the inflation shall then uh, went down or sh sh should be reduced and again the globalization optimization uh, will bring pressure uh, on this. So uh, from my perspective uh, this, uh, this is the main frame and coming uh, down to your second question, yeah, uh, the quick help made sense in 2020, but we should not turn into zombification. It means uh, we should not uh, uh, turn into yeah, what we've had uh, in all our countries. It means socialist uh, systems where everybody is preserved not to fail, because if everybody is preserved not to fail, the general system fails. Uh, so uh, this uh, is up to us now to uh, give the support only where the impacts are still there, but temporary uh, impacts, and not to compensate the structural changes, which definitely are taking place. And uh, maybe some of the changes, and it's again, uh, I think in Chinese is the problem and opportunity the same uh, mark. Uh, uh, we, we are now taking uh, the, the changes as the opportunity Maybe some changes with, or maybe, I'm sure, a lot of these changes of, uh, of uh, e-commerce uh, would be there, uh, but uh, in five years, and the pandemic brought us uh, these five years uh, in forward. So uh, I'm quite sure that uh, we should be wise and spend the public money, which are limited, uh, in, in a very reasonable uh, way, and not to zombify uh, the industries and the economy economy system which are not from a long-term perspective sustainable sustainability is the key excellent thank you for this frank account and that seamlessly brings us to the k-ship recovery but before we dive into that i want to ask mr charney uh, you work in your line of business uh, we, you cooperate with a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises that have been especially hard hit by this pandemic so do these concerns that we have talked about do they justify getting selective? And where would you like to see the policy help, the policy support sustained? What kind of firms, business models, projects? Look, I would say uh, almost regardless at which data points you look at, it's, it's evident that the SMEs are backbone of the European and local economy. So I think they should absolutely be supported. However, what I believe uh, we must uh, do is, is actually shift the focus, shift the focus from, uh, you know, the, the financial stimuli uh, that are helping to compensate losses, but gradually look at how we can support these SMEs, these entrepreneurs in terms of growing in the future, you know, in terms of uh, embracing digitalization, because in many aspects, digitalization is a hot trend. However, in many cases, reserved to larger enterprises who have the skills and the resources to benefit from it. Uh, they must be supported to be resilient, again, especially in a world where cyber threats are becoming more and more prevalent and uh, in general supported to have the access to the right business models, right, uh, right know-how. I think the good news that I can say as a representative of the private sector is that in principle all of this support does not have to come out of the public sector, out of public finance, because private sector is very much ready to get engaged here 
and uh, and uh, get involved. Uh, actually, in Mastercard, we do have we do have a philosophy which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, basically doing well by doing good, which which enables us effectively combine uh, focus on our business with supporting the local environment, including the SMEs. Uh, but there is still a role that the public sector has to play here. Uh, first and foremost. It has to create an environment where the public-private partnerships can be created effectively. And second of all, it has to support the environment with putting in place the right framework so that the different players out of the private sector can effectively coordinate on the support of the SMEs so that the ecosystem doesn't become a fight for a customer, but rather really effective support of the local businesses. Thank you very much um, for this account, public-private par partnerships also based on our findings as well as a part of the report will be absolutely instrumental in getting out of this crisis and in the recovery. Now, finally turning to you, Gordon, and the K-shape recovery. So the situation where some sectors are winning from this pandemic, from these structural shifts and others are losing and on a decline and potentially permanently. Who are the winners and the losers of this pandemic at a global scale and perhaps in Europe and in this region? Uh, what are the trends here? And maybe also what does it imply for the future course of policy? That's a very broad question. Yes. Let me start uh, uh, with a global answer. I, I believe this crisis, the pandemic, has not changed the, the long-term trajectories in the world, but just accelerated very much. Uh, many things in, at the micro level and the macro level and the macro level a few trends to say so I think we are seeing uh, a, a, dec a decline slowdown and probably reversal of globalization but it's not going to go back to n national level it's going to go back to regionalization if you think about supply chains or the political bifurcation in technology between China and, and the United States for example and in this regionalization clearly China and, and its world and the US and its world are key defining regions. The stake for Europe is to be the third leading re region sitting at the table where the decisions are made because if you don't sit at the table, you will be on the menu. And that's the choice uh, that Europe Nice Nicely put. Uh, second key trend, I think that because after a long period of, since basically the col collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a long period when market economy was the driving force in the world, and markets were the, the primary logic and politics was in, in, in secondary to that. I think it's going to change now because of these strategic uh, conflicts globally. Politics very often will overrule the market logic, and strategy will be more important than profits. Think about supply chains. Europe export, uh, importing 93% of its paracetamols from India, can you be dependent on India just for fever pills? It's a very simple, or think about the gas crisis uh, that is happening today. Yes, it may be cheaper in certain periods to buy gas from Russia, but it's only cheap as long as they, they want to keep it cheap. And uh, you, you want to be, I don't go more into that, but you understand what I'm, uh, I'm trying to say. Absolutely. And so now in this, in, this is going to be, I think, a long-term trend a cycle after after the pandemic and and this means those who understand the message of this crisis and can adapt their behavior to this can be on the upper end of the k mm. and those who don't will go down on on the other other end of the k now in terms of acceleration there were existing mega trends a few in the world before uh, the, the pandemic crisis and they just accelerated. One is, is climate change related, talking about business energy transition. That's a mega trend that's going to accelerate and the amount of money with the new EU regulation of the, the Sustainable Finance Directive, pushing all the investors and, and um, all the financial institutions, savers into investing only into climate change. Not friendly, that would be the wrong way to put it. Anti-climate change. Uh, right. uh, 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 products, more and more money is going to go that way. And I think the whole behavior uh, in the industry is going to change. Europe has a great opportunity there. And Central Europe, for think about the battery alliance in Slovakia, for example, um, has a great chance 
if it realizes what, what it can do. So one key, key trend is energy transition. Uh, can Central and Eastern Europe adapt to that or not? The second key trend is digitalization. Um, in a very broad sense, not just thinking about apps and services, but all our industries, the manufacturing processes. That's a big opportunity, but a big threat for us, because cheap labor is not so relevant anymore in the total product cost. So that's something we need to adapt to. And then, just to, to, to put the final comment here and then let the others comment on this is, the number one thing that we should spend all those, not all, the most of the recovery money on and, and, the, and the proceeds and dividends from, from the growth and return is education. Because yeah. what, what is changing in the world is that you need much higher educated workforce to be able to adapt to those changes in the world. And I think where, and you had the, an interesting figure on that in your report of where the different countries in the region stand, I think overall the quality of education in our region uh, is, and I'm talking about very practical skills and abilities, work-related education are behind the average of the European Union, not to mention places like Singapore or Japan or, or Korea. So there's a lot to catch up on and a lot of money should money and more than money, uh, thinking and, and planning should go into that. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion and I think you ending it up on a note that we really need to invest into education and especially so in this region is a great place to stop. Uh, do I see any raised hands? Uh, if not, alternatively, I would perhaps like to invite a representative from the app group if he or he is in the room to offer a comment, a first response or ask a question because we had a deal like that, but I don't see any raised hands. All right. Then aside from app group, anyone has any questions or comments? Yes, please. Daniel, uh, Slovakia, Pachium. Uh, you know, uh, it was interesting point made that uh, the driving force will move from uh, market to basically pol uh, politically driven decision. You know, uh, in Slovakia we transition from socialism to market economy. What we observed that political decisions uh, driven primarily led to basically economy not progressing well uh, compared to market economies. Now, that trend going in other countries, what will prevent similar effect and, uh, you know, economically uh, stalling behind China if the politics uh, will be more dominant than market forces? How we prevent same effect which socialism suffered? If I can start, sure. I, I yes. raise this point. Uh, just first clear, clarify my position. I don't like it. I'm just forecasting that this is going to happen even if I don't like it. And it's good to, since I'm not in politics, I don't need to talk about what should happen, but what will happen probably. And I think there is a great tendency when, when, when you have uh, geopolitics uh, uh, strengthening that governments will say, yes, it would be cheaper to buy, it would be more but easy. We should reg deregulate sectors, but we won't because there are other. So that, will, that is not so strange in China, but if you think about what's happening with the Chinese technology sector in the last few months, uh, you can see how the state is overriding the market uh, uh, reforms they introduced earlier. Uh, but it will happen in the US, and it is happening in the US, it is happening in Europe. So that is, I think these things are moving cycle, and if, if politics and government will mess up at the end or we become too dominant, then economies will slow down there will be, and then there will be a correction. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think the art of governance would be to keep the two, two in balance. Uh, but we sh I'm just warning all of us that we should prepare that the natural tendency now is that very often the market logic and the private uh, sector dominance of decision making that, that was prevalent in the world will be overruled very often by non-market non uh, uh, strategic considerations, rightly or wrongly. So we are, I think, in violent agreement. <laughs> yes, we are. State Secretary, did you have a comment or response? I mean, uh, there's a saying, uh, 
there's an old saying stating that uh, the tough times produce great leaders. Great leaders <laughs> produce uh, good times. Good times uh, produce... Weak men? Weak. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I was with my thought. Uh, weak men and uh, weak leaders produce, again, tough times, and this is the circle. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm quite uh, close uh, to, uh, to the ideas or to thoughts uh, with, uh, which uh, Gordon mentioned. Uh, I'm afraid if we in the global competition, China, India, US, Africa, and so on, Asia total, uh, were putting too much uh, pressure or too much focus on, uh, on political issues which are not in line uh, with uh, the market, we will lose. But I hope, uh, and uh, this is my second thought, uh, and uh, the, the history taught me that uh, the people are, or the countries, and also European Union, is able to adopt. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, if there is a showing that, uh, that we are slowing down and we are losing our market share and uh, the European Union is not performing properly, that the counter pressure will come and again uh, the, the leaders w would be forced to react uh, to that. So, uh, which exactly is the case and uh, more or less uh, this is the same idea which uh, Noah Yuval Harari, which is uh, a Jewish uh, writer, uh, is putting in his Homo Deus book that, uh, that uh, look at this pandemic and look at the pandemic uh, 100 years ago. Isn't it excellent from this perspective how the, how the civilization was able to manage all this crisis? I mean, uh, yeah, the people were dying, but, but, but the ratio between the people dying today and 100 years ago is 1 to 1,000. So, uh, so I believe and I try to be optimistic that uh, despite the fact that uh, we have temporary uh, cycles where politics are producing uh, market losses, that this will then at the end will again in the cycle be compensated and the pressure from the uh, people or from, the, uh, from all the countries will come back and accommodate uh, the policies, which more or less was the idea I think uh, Mr. Prime Minister mentioned also in his first panel that, uh, yeah, it's questionable uh, whether the leadership of the Europe in the green agenda uh, is reasonable if the other regions will not follow. But if this will be the case also in, in several years from now, then we have to adopt uh, the policy. Because, uh, yeah, Europe alone could not... Uh, save the whole planet, we all have to work together. So I try to be optimistic and I hope that the civilization showed in the past that uh, the accommodation is going on. No, that's a really interesting uh, point and I think this is also a great point to stop. So I would like to thank you to the distinguished panel for their insights and for what has been an enticing discussion. And uh, coming right up at this stage, uh, we have a session on supercharging the recovery in the region of Central and Eastern Europe towards the Danube Tech Valley, which is our up and coming uh, flagship initiative. Uh, the panel will be led by our own GPI director, Alana Kutsko, and is featuring a very intense uh, panel of speakers. So thank you for your attention and stay tuned. Thank you.